All right. It is uh, five o'clock, so I will call together uh, or to order the, this meeting of the Finance and Personnel Committee. Uh, we'll start out with the roll call. Alder Feldy. Present. Alder Ackley. Here. Alder Flicky Paneski. Here. Alder Perella. Here. Uh, Alder Mitchell's here. Five out of five. We have a quorum. Will you all please stand and join me in the pledge? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have a uh, pretty full room today, so... Uh, we'll go into item number four for introduction of committee members and staff. Uh, for everybody up on the dais, if we can have all of the members of the Finance and Personnel Committee introduce themselves first and then uh, other elders who are also in attendance follow up. We'll go my right to left. Trey Mitchell, District 9, Committee Chairman. Todd Wolf, City Administrator. Jessica Gurdia, District 7. Uh, Dean Zucker, District 9. We're all coming out. Go ahead, District 6. And I apologize that I did not turn on any of the microphones for that. Um, all right, moving on to item number five then. We have uh, approval of the minutes from our July 11th meeting. Is there any discussion on those minutes? If not, we'll be looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second then. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, chair votes aye. The ayes have it, the motion passes. Minutes are approved. And with that, we are on to item number six, which is RO number 11 of 2223. Uh, submitting a claim from Laura Campman for alleged damages to her tire when she drove over the cover of a metalworks water hole. Attorney Adams. So this, uh, this is just here for you to file. The claim was uh, previously denied. Thank you. Questions or comments? If not, we would be looking for a motion to file. File. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second then, seeing no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. With that, we are on to item seven, which is arrow number 19 of 2223, submitting a claim from Richard A. Olson for alleged damages to his vehicle when it was struck by a city of Sheboygan garbage truck while parked on Custer Avenue. This is also here for you to file. This is a, a, a claim that was actually paid, not in the amount that it was originally claimed, but it was paid. Questions or comments on this one? If not, we'll be looking for a motion to file. I move to file. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second then, seeing no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. Next up, we are on to item number eight, which is RO number 40 of 2223, uh, submitting for your information the 2023 budget schedule and 2023 preliminary budget fiscal factors for guidance uh, prior to departmental budget preparation. My understanding is that this one was on here for our information. If there's any questions that committee members have, or comments to be made regarding uh, the doc attached document? Elder Perella? Yeah, I just wanted to know uh, what is the Wisconsin's expenditure restraint program? Okay. Director Krieger. Thank you. There are two tools that the state has in place to uh, control the levy that the city is able to put through each year and expenditure restraint program is one of those. If we qualify within that expenditure restraint, there are certain qualifications including uh, keeping the levy increase each year to a certain percentage and it's based on different indexes and such uh, provided by the state. If we stick to uh, the allotted amount, the state actually gives us a payment for doing so. 
Thank you. Administrator Wolf. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to point out for the elders to, um, to realize that over the years, the expenditure restraint um, dollars have been reducing year over year. So we, we are dependent on the expenditure restraint as part of our, our revenue that we budget in. And year over year, that, that amount has been decreasing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? If not, we would be uh, looking for a motion to approve on this one. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second then. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. With that, we're on to item nine, uh, RO number 143 of 2122 submitting a summons and complaint in the matter of PNC Bank National Association versus Ray R. Pape at Al. So this is just another one that uh, you're going to be filing. This was a summons and complaint in which the city was involved as uh, a lien holder uh, and the matter has now been dismissed. So we can file the document. Fair enough. Questions, comments on this one? Uh, if not, we'll be looking for that motion to file. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Then seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye. The ayes have it. The motion passes. We are on to item 10, which is resolution number 40 of 2223. A resolution authorizing a transfer in the 2022 budget from contingency to the Department of Public Works to fund the unexpected replacement of their Leica robotic total station. Is there anybody that would like to speak on this one? Director Beeble. Does he agree? Director Beeble. Director Beeble. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yes, this, this budget um, transfer is to we have a what's um, we use for our surveying equipment for for our engineering and design system. So this survey equipment was out early in the year. Um, unfortunately, with a large gust of wind, I tipped this unit over. And it's a very expensive, high precision piece of equipment. So it was totaled. Um, unfortunately, um, accident happened, and we're looking to replace this piece of equipment. This we've actually replaced it already. But now this is uh, kind of the funding now to replace some of the budgets that we took to uh, replace this piece of equipment. Thank you. Uh, Elder Flicky Panaski. So, uh, so it was damaged, you bought a new one, and now we're finding money for the new one we bought? How does that work? <laughs> we, we, we use some balances in some of our existing accounts that we, but now to replace what we had earlier in the year, otherwise by the end of the year, we're not gonna have money in those accounts, in other words. So we're replenishing it out of the contingency account so that we have money in those accounts to, to reimburse us. And refresh my memory, how much was it? Ish. It's right around 40,000. Okay, thank you. Now I found it. Hmm. Any other discussion on this one? If not, we'll be looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Do we have a second? I'll do a second. All right, we have a motion and a second then. Uh, seeing no further discussion, all in favor? All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. Uh, next up, we are on item 11, which is resolution number 42 of 2223. Uh, resolution authorizing a transfer in the 2022 budget from contingency to the police department for unanticipated repairs resulting from a burst sprinkler pipe. Chief? 
Sure, early in the year, um, we had a sprinkler head in the ceiling of the vestibule in the entrance to the police department. Um, combination of very cold temperatures and the way that the wind was blowing, um, it froze and then the pipe burst and so we had water damage um, in the lobby of the police department there um, and then to some of the carpet and, and inside of the municipal courtroom. So insurance picked up some of it and this is what's left. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments on this one? If not, we'll be looking for a motion to approve. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second then. Uh, seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. That brings us to item number 12, which is resolution number 43 of 2223, a resolution authorizing a budget amendment to pay for the hiring of an engagement coordinator in the Senior Services Department. Hi, Director of Senior Services, Emily Rendell Araujo here. Um, so as you likely know, we are getting ready to move into our new building and on track um, for an anti anticipated opening date in November. Um, previously, the Senior Services Department did have three full-time employees, including this coordinator that was kept in the TO, but uh, the position was left open as we were not operating a building. So as we prepare to move into our new building, we're ready to have a third full-time person helping us run programs and run the building. And as you can see, we have some supporters in the room with us. Um, so we'd like to reactivate that position. Uh, what's unique about this, um, and a, a very lucky, good, and kind thing, is that the Friends of Uptown Social has offered to pay for the cost of this position in the 2022 budget year. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from I mean, Administrator Wolf? Thank you, Chair. I just want to thank the Friends of, of Uptown Social for supporting this position for for uh, this year, it's a uh, it's a great partnership, and it's really nice to see. It's great to see uh, the relationship that Emily has with the support of the uh, of the friends group. So thank you again for all that you do. I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to thank him for the comment and then second it. <laughs> but yes, thank you. Um, any other comments on this one? Discussion, questions, compliments? Alder Barella. Yes, it just said I, I look forward to the grand opening. We do too. <laughs> <laughs> I think the mayor's excited to get his conference room back. <laughs> Fair enough. If there's uh, no further discussion, we'll be looking for a motion to approve on this one. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Then seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we're to item number 13, uh, which is RC number 276 of 2122. Uh, your committee to whom was referred RO number 31 of 2122 by city clerk uh, submitting a summons and complaint in the matter of Link Media Wisconsin LLC versus City of Sheboygan. I think somebody wants me to get my steps in. So Just get a sign. <laughs> this is another matter for filing. Uh, this was a lawsuit that was filed against the city. Uh, the matter has been dismissed. Uh, we did, as probably some of you saw in the media, with a, with a settlement that's designed to be a one-time settlement that hopefully will not impact us going forward. Questions or comments on this one? If not, we'll be looking for a motion to file. So moved. Second. All right, uh, we have a motion and a second then. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. All, all opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it and the motion passes. Uh, 
That brings us to item number 14, which is a direct referral of RO number 44 of 2223 uh, by the finance director submitting a report to the Finance and Personnel Committee regarding the progress of the Carlson Detman Compensation Study. I do have a PowerPoint. I'm not sure if you can get it up. Well, I will start uh, with a con an introduction. We have two consultants here today with us. Uh, Patrick Lynn is from Carlson Detman Consulting. He is the individual who has been uh, working with myself and Administrator Wolf over the past many months um, and also with the department heads over the past few uh, weeks and also today they um, had meetings with department heads that requested them. He has 19 years of public sector experience, including being human resources director multiple places, but most recently Calumet County uh, in Wisconsin. And then we have Sandy Motts here too. She is from Cunningham and Butler. She is the individual we brought in for today's meetings to sit down with the department heads that had concerns over the study, just to be an HR professional side um, so that we can have that um, a little bit of a buffer, we'll say, between the um, uh, consulting uh, compensation piece and then just the human resources aspect, uh, just an outside opinion to help us out. She uh, has 30 years, uh, actually more than 30 years of public sector experience in human resources and she is the former human resources uh, director from Appleton. She was there for 24 years. So she went through a very similar compensation study as we're going through right now. I will go through this quickly because I have gone through it a couple times, but I did want to make sure that I at least touched on some items uh, before we start any discussion or questions that the committee does have. Uh, the timeline, April 2021, the study was um, approved by council uh, to go with Carlson Detman. From May 2021 through July of 2021, employees and supervisors uh, were to fill out job description questionnaires, and these were detailing different duties that they have, assigning percentages to those duties, coming up with the uh, required education, required experience, all of those details that really help Carlson Detman pick apart these positions and decide um, and analyze where they should go within the scale. And then human resources had their chance to review the JDQs at that point as well. In August and September of last year, the department heads met with Carlson Detman here on site and there was an individual also remote in and they went through, answered questions, brought up concerns to Carlson Detman of um, what might be different in their department from others that they have seen, things like that. In September 2021, in November, this is just a kind of a gap that I have um, for um, Carlson Detman was doing their review and actually doing um, the development of the wage scale. After that, um, I just wanted to put this um, out there for clarity that the Human Resources Director was no longer working on the study as of November 2021. So that is really where I became more involved in this study. December 2021 to April 2022, that's when the City Administrator and myself reviewed the draft scales. And that's when I think I sent plenty of emails of questions and had three separate meetings with uh, Patrick just to answer my questions and concerns of the study, just to make sure I was understanding and questioning what I thought might be brought up, brought forward later on. In May of 2022 and June of this year, we had presentations uh, both at department head meetings and the committee and council meetings from Patrick. Those were in detail about the process, the study, um, all of the results, things like that. And in June of 2022 and July of 2022, I'm just saying that we were reviewing the study by finance and personnel and also council. It had gone to finance, got approved to be pushed to council. Council, as you know, pushed it back to finance for further review. So one thing that I had realized when we had conversations with certain individuals was that there was not very, very much clarity when it comes to certain definitions or words that we've been using throughout this study process. So I just wanted to point out three just to help with hopefully the conversation today. So we have the ratings, which that is Carlson Detman's calculated figure related to the requirements of each position. So that rating is what was used to put people onto a grade. So the grade is the range of pay that a position would pay. And then the step 
is the placement on the grade and the actual rate of pay somebody would receive. So those are the three kind of terms that we use. Um, I will also say control point is another one that I should have added here. So control point is using the 100% of our market data. We will go further into that later, but the control point is really where that middle point of the scale is. And, and Patrick can correct me anytime if I misspeak. <laughs> He's writing notes. Um, so I just wanted to touch very high level on the Carlson Detman process. First, they got all these job description questionnaires and they reviewed them and analyzed them. They met with the department heads to try and gain an understanding based on their expertise and what their departments do. They take those job description questionnaires and rate each position on five different factors and those are listed. They go from thinking challenges and problem solving, work environment, preparation and experience, but you can see those five uh, on the screen. From there, the jobs are placed onto grades based on that scoring or rating and they create benchmark jobs. They then compare positions to market data to develop that wage scale. Once they have a wage scale developed, they use mathematical analysis to confirm accuracy and uh, compare that wage scale to the market data to make sure that we are uh, using correct information. And then they did provide the city with draft scales for review. And at this point, they, ha they have been answering questions from the city on placements and following up uh, with concerns as necessary. I'm not sure if we wanna continue or if people want, question want to ask questions. Um, I have a couple things that I had promised the committee, so I do have those in my slides, but I can leave it up to the chair if you'd like me to continue or break for any questions. I'll give you a break for a moment just to ask if anybody has any questions about anything that's been covered so far. Elder Perella. So I have I have a question for um, for Patrick. The um, the five criteria that determine the the rating do they weigh the same, or one of them is more? Uh, important than others. Yeah, we had a similar conversation about that this afternoon, and yes, to both of your answers, or to both of your questions, that when our job evaluation starts, it's kind of like the SAT. You sign your name to the SAT, you get a certain number of points. And so in our system, the lowest number of points you're going to possibly ever see is 250 points. At that stage, 50 points for each criteria, they're weighted equally at 20%. As you work your way through the system, so as your position gains in responsibility, gains usually in required knowledge or education, bigger problems that you're resolving, decision making begins to control or be, become the, the largest factor. Not by leaps and bounds, but certainly you know, at a higher weighting, and it stands to reason that the further you get up into an organization, the more decision making authority and, and responsibility you're gonna be placed. Um, right behind that would be thinking challenges and, and education, then interactions, and the lowest weighted factor, still weighted importantly, is our work environment factor. And so, the, the, question, so the, the answer to your question is at the beginning of the system, it's more narrowly compacted in terms of the weighting. As you get further and further through your pay structure, decision making begins to take a, a prominent role. May I? So everything, if I translate what you said to in terms that are, that I can relate to, uh, if everything is equal, then you would look at the decision making. Let's say two positions have the same rating for all criteria, then what is that you, how would you evaluate the difference between the two positions? Would you would start looking at the decision making level? So I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to make sense of the idea that they start having all the same value, but they end up in, and but decision making following, followed by thinking, challenging and problem solving will then have a prominent or more prevalent 
wait after that. You threw a wrinkle in there that maybe is confusing me a little bit. And you said they, they have the same criteria. If they're the same job, then they would be rated the same. So I'm trying to answer, I'm sure that you address uh, this question in some of your meeting today. I assume, maybe not, sure. but due to the conversations I had with, with some people before. So if since um, some people notice some uh, discrepancies between levels that would otherwise be considered the same. Okay. But so I'm trying to understand if the, if uh, if those in theory should be the same, maybe some of these criteria have been given a, a different weight depending on the department. That's what I'm trying to understand. So I, if I, I hope I'm, you'll tell me if I don't answer your question, okay. that I think part of it is the perception that the jobs are same, the same. Our challenge is that we don't work off of job title. It's an incredibly dangerous thing for us to do that we have to dig into the job duties and responsibilities and other requirements to evaluate it. So one, one department, one organization, the, these jobs are the same, but when you dig in, in fact, we had one where we had one of the departments that said, these jobs are identical, and I actually took the two JDQs in the meeting and I used Microsoft Word to actually merge them over the top of each other, and it was night and day difference. And so to say that the jobs are the same sometimes is not the same as digging into the job duties and responsibilities and then seeing that they're not the same. So perception is not always reality. Sometimes we, and we had a couple of those where, yeah, this is kind of like that other job we need to align that. I mean, there's, you know, the, those situations did exist, but in many situations, it's not an apples to apples comparison in some situations. And so it's, you know, kind of the connection from one pay system to the post pay system there is no right, and you didn't hire us, or if you, you know, even going to anyone else to replicate what you already have. You know, the desire was let's look at our jobs independently, evaluate them, let's look at the market, and come up with a structure that then we have to dig into the duties and responsibilities, which invariably means there's going to be differences from what is today versus what's being recommended. You know, and if there's some perception that the jobs are identical, um, and we, like I said, we've had a handful of those today as we dug further and further into them, it, at least to us, and some of those, in fact, I had some notes here in terms of some of the conversations, was we need clarifying documentation. What you're describing to us does not at all exist in the job documentation that was presented to us. We need to get something, either get it revised, or we need to go with what's on paper already. So it's, it's not as clear cut as saying the jobs are the same. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the material covered so far? If not, uh, thank you, Patrick. One question that was posed previously was about the potential of splitting out the public work scale, um, which is how the city has historically been doing the compensation plan, but we did um, do some research and 13 of the communities that uh, were reviewed, they do not have separate scales. And I would say that the majority of municipalities from what I have been, what I have seen and heard about, they do not split out the scales. So that is why we, were, we would be recommending still keeping those two scales together. These are 13 of the comparable communities that we had um, considered in our study. And it was um, the ones all available online uh, with short amount of time to get research, so. I can testify that I don't know that I have any clients that have separate. Yeah. Patrick, can you come up to the microphone, please? That in our book of business, we don't have any clients that I'm aware of that have separate public works scales. We might have some that have a separate utility scale. Um, we might have some that have a separate library scale. And then if I work in counties, nursing homes are one that typically come out as, as separate. But usually, if the jobs unless there's something incredibly unique about the organization, and in, in public works, like I said, we, we, we don't have any that are separate scales. Could that happen in the future if the, the, you know, the, the skilled trades, blue collar roles keep evolving as, as we anticipate them in the next few years? Sure, but in terms of today, we don't have that. Alder Decker. I guess I, my question is, is that how do you, how do you work when, you, when, when, when there's differences, when, when, when uh, the wage scale needs to be adjusted for like a public works job and, how, and, and when it's separate, how do you then do that if you don't have a separate scale? 
all of a sudden, you know, all the 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 the, the wage or the um, the position, you know, the demand is is greater. The, the, it's so how do you then adjust that if you have it on the same wage scale as, as say someone downtown here? I, I will just touch on city policy currently, and then I'll have Patrick jump in. Currently, if there's a table of organization change, that is actually built into our ordinances. So similar to a budget amendment, that would have to come through council if there was a budget impact. But just because they're on the scale current on a curtain, current grade at this moment doesn't mean it cannot be changed. The director of public works can work with myself, HR director and city administrator to formulate uh, what would be a fair wage and that would be brought for, forth to council for approval. But then I'll pass on to Patrick. So I think the, the underlying theme is this, is that I, I, and I mean this when I say, I love our job evaluation system. I think it helps cut through a lot of the um, otherwise confusing aspects. It, it boils it down to its duties and responsibilities. But there are sometimes two occasions where we need to step outside of that system in terms of how we place jobs. The first one would be compression. You know, in, in the police and fire world, you know, if the job evaluation and or market pricing doesn't, or job evaluation system in conjunction with the, the market pricing doesn't align, there are times when we have to adjust positions manually to make certain that we have people promoting to those roles. So compression would be the first one that we're constantly addressing on, on our projects. The other one is market. You know, the one that, to which you're alluding, yeah. which is, um, and there are certain roles that are notoriously difficult or they ebb and flow, just depending on, on the, the environment, that if there's one clear market data that is showing us that our job evaluation system just isn't cutting it. A really good example, and it doesn't apply here so it's easier to use, is we do a job evaluation project and a market pricing for an electric utility. You know, the electric lineman might fit at this point in the grade, but w based on job evaluation, but we know that if we don't have it up here, you're never gonna hire another electric lineman. But we've got data for days for that particular role where we can point to it. So every once in a while, there's a market adjustment. But we're always careful when we start talking about market because, you know, the goal in this particular case in the, in the discussion still is, do you build a structure on the median market, half pay more, half pay less, or do you push it a little bit further, especially given the current economic times, such as being recommended here, to just kind of get a head start knowing that the market's gonna catch back up, is you're not looking at what's the highest employer paying in the marketplace, nor are you looking at what the lowest is. So it's always trying to find what's that, what's that place in the market in the data that aligns with your market philosophy. So I, I know a lot of times we'll have people saying, hey, I've got this one employer who's paying more. I would guarantee you have one employer who's paying less. Just mathematically, that's how it has to work. But when you do have a job that is falling behind and, and this is probably another piece that we, we work with clients on, if it is hampering your ability to hire. So not just is the market evolving, but you, you know, we used to get, now I would say categorically across the state, public works employees. You know, I've heard the story, you know, 100 times over, we used to get 400 applicants for this role, now we're getting 50. That could be public works, that could be jailer, that could be correct um, dispatcher, that could be engineer, you name the job title, that there are just fewer applicants in general. And the question is, what's the quality of those? Uh -huh. And if you're not getting the quality, so if you get 10 applications, but all 10 are quality, it's probably not an indication that you're really bottoming out. Now, if you get 10 applications and none of them are worth, worthy of hire, now we got something we need to really dig into. So it's, it's not as easy as saying, here's a market rate, let's plug it in. Here's a market rate, here's any hiring difficulties or, or recruiting challenges, and then making that recommendation. And we do that quite frequently with our clients, that as you get further and further out in a new wage structure, it loses you know, over the course of time, which is why every decade or so you wanna kinda go back and, and revisit it. But in the intervening time, so our recommendation, recommendation only, is every two to three, two to four years, but I would say probably three being the, the hallmark, going back and revisiting the market. Not evaluating all the jobs, just saying, where do we stand in the marketplace? Sometimes that analysis says, hey, here's three jobs that have really fallen out of line. We recommend you address those because of, of whatever particular circumstances. We could also have, I know I'm giving you a little bit more of what you asked for, but we could mm -hmm. also say, here's a job that's fallen out of line with market, but you're not experiencing the hiring challenges for whatever reason. 
but you have the knowledge. So if you do experience it, here's the market rate, you don't need to call us again, you've got that data in, in hand. So market does play a role in terms of what we're looking at. I guess the other question, also when it comes to downgrading jobs, um, because a, a good example, I guess I'm gonna take that is, is our, our, our garbage system. You know, we used to have, our, our guys used to ride on the back of the trucks, hang yep. on to the things, they you know, were jumping off in the middle of winter, the, the injury rate was phenomenal, things like that. We now have an automated garbage system, guys sit in the truck, they push buttons, and not saying it's not a hard, but it's not, it's not as, Risky of a job sure. as what it was in the past. Yeah. So you know the market has is a little you know. So what about something like that? I mean, was it that you're a little bit high on that actually? I would. The answer, the short answer is yes. We do have situations that happen, and, yes. and we might even have some of those situations as we fine tune and deliver final recommendations to the city where we have to address that very thing that you're discussing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, you know, what will happen? What will happen is that we're changing this job. We're not going to cut the existing employees' pay, well, and that yeah, and that so, I understand. So, but yeah, it happens, and you know that hey, we just automated this functions. And it kind of very similar to the I'll use that garbage truck example, sure. it, you know. But that happens, you know. We went from a manual meter read situation to a proximity reader or to a tower based or whatever that you you took a lot of wear and tear off people's legs or or driving, you know, those sorts of things. That technology and other program evolutions, absolutely. And you'll find, hey, we had somebody do this and we decided, you know what, it was a nice to have, not a necessary to have. And so we stripped that duty away. So it doesn't happen as frequently as jobs evolving upwards. But on the reclassification, like when I say reclassification, projects done, adopted, yeah. a year has gone by, yeah. two years have gone by, that we will get those situations of, yeah, it's just a different world and, and we need to change. And so let's adjust it downward and, and plan. So it happens all the time. I guess. <laughs> Were there any other questions or comments before we continue? And this is kind of small up here, but I wanted to just go through um, the implementation that was originally proposed. Um, at, the, each employee would go to the next step on the grade that the study has placed them, and we had it that if an employee had five years or more of experience at the city, they would be moved to a step five minimum. I'm trying to talk and point here at the same time. So I did put a table together just for uh, illustration purposes, and again, it is pretty small up on the screen, but um, we have two, two individuals, for example, that have 10 years of experience at the city and two individuals with four years of experience at the city. And then we have current step placement. So we have somebody who's been here 10 years, they're between a two and a three based on their current rate, they're between those two steps on the scale. Because they have more than five years of experience, they would have been placed at a step five. If an individual has, uh, 10 years of experience and is currently between an eight and a nine, they would have gone to a nine on the, on the step in their grade. For the same, let's say the person only has four years of experience and it's the same type of uh, step placement currently, the person who has four years of experience um, is between the two and a three, they would go to a three. So the main difference between the 10 and the four year um, individual, we'll say, is that the 10 year individual would automatically get put at that step five when gr <laughs> when, when uh, the person with four years of experience would only get to that next step, which is step three. And then that last individual, again, because they're already between an eight and a nine, even though they only have four years of experience, they would go to a step nine. And that is likely because they got brought in at a higher rate than the person with the 10 years of experience. The estimated cost for implementation, I reran these numbers again, just to uh, make sure that we were most up to date. Currently we have, for 2022, we would have a budget impact of just over $322,000, and we do have $400,000 set aside for this, so it would have about $80,000 of buffer 
which I would recommend using in 2023 because you can see the budget impact of just this implementation proposal is $881,000. Any questions on that? Thank you. Um, what's the magic of five years? We had recommended five years because if they had come in at the minimum point, that would have been the control, they would have made it to the control point already and that is the control point. So that is putting them at the market rate. 100% of market rate? Correct. Thank you. Any other questions before we continue? Good to go. All right, we had the request for another costing analysis um, scenario, so I came up with the uh, attached uh, analysis. If we were to implement based on years in current position with the table that is shown on the screen, if somebody were to have 30 years in the position, they would be at a step placement of 13 at a minimum, and it would go down to if you have five years in your position, you would be at a step three. That is the uh, amounts that are listed below then. It would be 286,000 for 2022, but then 2023 would be a higher increase from the initial proposed, uh, and it would be $1.06 million. And that's mostly because there would not be as many individuals at that step five. Um, as we had discussed previously, the schedule or the wage scale is actually set up that you get bumped up a little higher throughout the scale, the steps one to five to get you to that control point. And after that, you're going up instead of two and a half percent, it's one and a quarter percent. And that would then have those, the steps after the control point are stretched out a little further. So that's where the initial plan has a little bit lower of a cost next year, but it's really caught this year and then this actually has the opposite effect. Hoping I'm making sense, so ask questions if you have them. Any questions? So far, so good. Okay, and I do wanna mention the factor um, with the next step, we do have a two and a half percent COLA or cost of living adjustment factored in at this point just for reference purposes. Additionally, I wanted to just point out again the cost of putting individuals on the step, on the grade, based on their actual tenure. So if we were to look at somebody with 30 years of experience, technically, if they would have gone through the scale, they would have been maxed out. So that is this cost. Uh, the 704,000 would just be this year's cost, and it'd be 1.34 million next year. Now I'm going to backtrack to my PowerPoint a second. So I just also wanted to touch on the back pay. Um, I wanted just to bring it to the committee's attention again that the current version of Munis or the payroll system that we have at this moment does not easily determine back pay. It is actually very, very manual and uh, we just did back pay for the police union contract and that was actually, and I. I would feel bad saying it was simple because it's not simple, but it was two full days of work just to implement that and calculate and set up our payroll system for that. And it was just changing the rates. The salary structure was already in there. The positions were already attached to that salary structure. It was just changing rates. So if we do the complete um, comp plan implementation and have back pay with that, we aren't even sure how much time that would take because we're manipulating every single position, every single person in each position, and then we're also having to manually calculate all back pay. I just wanted to bring it up because the amount of work is substantial, and the employees who are uh, would be in charge of this are actually already helping Human Resources Department significantly, so it would just be uh, a lot on the people that are handling this. And that's all I had in my presentation, but of course uh, we can answer any questions, bring up any concerns that you may have while we have these two awesome consultants with us so that uh, we can make sure that we address anything you have. 
Oh, there, Flaky Vanesky. Thank you. I would like to hear from Patrick and Sandy about the um, meetings with those department heads who chose to have meetings and what some of that outcome was. I told Sandy to interrupt me anytime she pleases here, so if I get it perfectly, she won't, but I know she's also not afraid to. Um, so, yeah, we met with um, six departments today, um, community development, court, fire, library, public works, and IT. And if I miss someone, I apologize, but I think that, that was the extent of what we reviewed. And throughout the day, I, I think we had some very good conversations, um, some vigorous, more vigorous than others. Um, but if I look at, there was basically five tentative outcomes, you know, that we um, we were here to listen. Um, we knew that we would have to dig a little bit more deeply on some of the classifications depending on what we received. So a couple of them we realized pretty quickly in our conversation that, and I think I alluded to this previously, that the documentation um, did not have what we were hearing from the department heads. And so trying to get that clarified, our preference, as it should be yours, is it's, it's, it's much more important to have the written confirmation of those duties than the verbal. Um, it, it's, you know, we found over the course of, of the years that um, there's something more meaningful about putting what you're putting it into writing as opposed to just simply stating it. Um, some of the jobs, or at least a couple of them, have changed in the interim of this process, you know, and it, it's been, and that's not at all surprising. And so again, we're awaiting some additional clarification on the job documentation. Some were clear both ways. You know, either this doesn't make sense, I don't know that we could get behind this, and others that, yep, got to change it. You know, and based on what we had or um, additional clarification based on what we were able to dig through the job documentation, but there were some that were very clear. Um, many of the requests, and I, and, I, and I said this jokingly, but I think the people knew when I was, that they were implementation issues as opposed to job evaluation or job grading issues, which really kind of fall back on the city because that involves the amount of money that you are willing and or able to spend in the implementation of this process. And so any deviation from what Caitlin just presented, um, we would need to have the city make certain that they were comfortable with that, um, if at all. And then there was um, one or two of them that really resulted in more strategic conversations. That here's where the position <coughs> should be, but it's not currently performing at that level. And so some conversations about here's what you would need to include, to add, um, to coach existing employees to, to get it to the grade where it was being sought. And, and again, that's not an uncommon conversation relating to um, the, whether it's in a, in a formal appeals process or, or the preliminary review in this particular case, to have those conversations that, you no, know, this, is, this isn't the job we're seeing, but here's how to get to the job that you're, you're seeing. And, and I, I thought those were pretty um, particularly um, valuable. Um, I think as we look at you know some of the conversations regarding the conversation of the current system to the proposed system, that I think a lot we're trying to link one to the other in terms of grade placement or you know <coughs> grade structuring. To be honest, and, and, and I do this on purpose on these projects, I almost always never look at the prior system because I don't want that to influence our results. You paid for an original review, you should get an original review of the system. Now, at the end, of course, there are conversations because even though we don't view it, the employees certainly do have that view of the world of, hey, I was a grade 10 before, why aren't I a grade 10 before? Um, but any linkage to the two you know, is pure happenstance as opposed to intentional. Um, I, I think, you know, and I think Caitlin said this before, and I've heard Todd say it, and I'll just say it myself, that the last thing I would wish on any particular client is to um, conduct a study of this nature without a, a human resources department intact. Um, Todd and Caitlin have kept this ball rolling um, despite the turnover you've had, um, have been in, in, as engaged as any client that we've had, um, and have been very particular not to, to put their thumbs on any scale, just a, hey, here's this position, we've received questions from our department, what do you think? but I've received zero coaching of this position shall be at this level or shall be at this grade. And so I wanna make that distinction um, that we, we have really been called upon to kind of be that independent um, um, set of eyes. Um, and I, I think we've heard a couple, you know, that um, in light of, of some recent, you know, challenges internally that 
some departments have just said, you know, I've done what I, we've done what we needed to do to keep our human resources operations afloat, which might not otherwise be ideal in terms of centralized versus decentralized. I get it, you know, that, you know, nature abhors a vacuum, and, and when you do have that vacuum, people are gonna do whatever they can to keep things moving. But some evidence of that as we, we've gone through today. Um, in terms of, I just wanna make certain that we talk about I wanna talk about a couple things because Caitlin's thrown some terminology out, accurate information, but as we look at this, um, based on some of the conversations we've had, you know, we talk, we use the terms percent and percentile sometimes interchangeably and it can get confusing and, and since this is being recorded, luckily there's the opportunity to go back and review this as I spit it out with it. When we talk about the control point being 100% of market, that's 100% of the estimated market for that grade, which let's just, for the sake of argument today, you know, that we're gonna stick with the median market. We're not talking about any, you know, blend to kind of advance it. That that 100% is the 50th percentile of the market. Mm -hmm. And so percent, you know, we build the minimum and the maximum on percentages of that control point. Okay. That control point is intended to be the median, the 50th percentile of the marketplace in most cases. But I hear this term market rate batted around quite a bit. That I have a job that is rated at $25 an hour at the control point. People think that we've come up with some sort of magic number that we've been able to pull from the mountaintop to say this is a $25 an hour job. We could have 10 different surveys. And I could have one survey giving me a $23 an hour rate, a $27 an hour rate, and anything in between. I could have one giving me an 80 dollar an hour rate that we ultimately would have to throw out, you know, due to statistical analysis. But the point is that that grade is intended to represent the market for that job, or at least the approximated market. That minimum to the maximum is intended to reflect the market range of pay that would otherwise be acceptable. So to hear the term market rate, I would love it to be at that control point, or at least within a step or two beyond that, Realistically speaking, you know, that we try to make certain, you know, again, through our analysis, that, that those, that we're not falling too far out of, you know, give or take 5%. It happens. Um, but again, you've got a pretty healthy um, width of, of jobs um, in between. So I want to just, like I said, I want to make certain that we understand when we talk about market rate, sometimes implies a level of precision that I don't think anybody can provide. And when we talk about percents versus percentiles, I know that that can get lost in the weeds very quickly. I sometimes have to revisit it myself to make certain that we don't. So that was kind of the high level of overview. Um, we um, just kind of in, in terms of follow up, I'm sure that's probably also, you know, where do we stand? When is this gonna be done? Um, as I indicated that there's a handful of jobs we need revised and or new job documentation. You know, that could materialize overnight, which I, I doubt people got other things that they need to do as part of their jobs, um, I would expect it's probably gonna take a, a week or so. And, and so making certain that we have that information and then going back through, and, and some, of those, some of these things we'll be able to analyze relatively quickly, some of them we already accomplished today in, in terms of our cleanup. So I would expect in the next couple of weeks to have the information. Um, upon my return, I'll be going on vacation the first week of August here, and then upon my return, my intent is to just plow through that because it's not, it's a day's worth of work, if that, if not. Um, so we're waiting for more documentation and additional analysis and then having the recommendations back to the city. Did I answer, I, I know you asked for additional clarification. Did I answer it and provide you what, what you were seeking? I, I have a question about the 50th percentile. Sure. I am remembering the uh, graph that we saw that had the, had the line, and then it plotted our own salary along the 50th percentile, and they were fairly close together. Is, am I? You're correct. I'm correct, okay. So when we talk about taking it to the 60, 62.5 yep. percentile, 62.5 yep. percentile. Sure. So instead of keeping our wages smack in the middle or just a little bit above, mm -hmm. because of the time uh, where we are in the universe about hiring people, yep. we've decided to move 
people up to the 62 and a half percentile. Sure. Correct. Thank you. And it's done for two reasons. One is exactly that the market is continuing to move mm -hmm. and probably will, even if we get you know declared with the recession anytime soon, it's still gonna keep moving because we don't have enough employees to fill all the roles that we have. Okay. The second, and I, in fact, I know it's true with your study as it is with every other study. In fact, I had one last week where I was meeting with the village board and 75% of their comparable organizations were in the process of conducting their own wage studies. So we knew that the data we were using was going to become obsolete pretty quickly. Not by you know, huge percentages, by, by enough to be measurable. And so making those recommendations to kind of cushion the blow of those additional wage studies coming online and being adopted allows you to weather that storm a little bit more easily as well. Okay, thank you. Did you have any other follow-up? I actually have a, I have, I have a question for Sandy. Or do we? Sandy, with a different perspective and a different set of eyes, Patrick, Patrick talked about the five or six things that um, were significant that were brought up. Did you, A, see the same things, and B, see other things in addition? Yes. And so from a human resources perspective, I had several observations in terms of listening to the departments today that maybe have added a little bit to the lack of the administration maybe with the current pay plan. So for example, departments are modifying their job descriptions and because of the void in your human resources department, there isn't anyone in HR that are vetting whether those are regular and permanent changes or temporary changes. And so sometimes you need to change a job description on a temporary basis because it's just the market. You, you can't fill the job the way it is, so you have to ask other staff to step up. But sometimes then those job descriptions become permanent changes. And so are those job descriptions being updated accurately in the files? And so some of the other thing with the job descriptions not being updated, we had departments trying to look at where their jobs were rated in comparison with other job descriptions that they could view online through the NeoGov system. And many of those job descriptions, it appears, have not been updated. So the departments that are trying to do comparisons are looking at maybe old data. Not their fault, it's just what is there for them right now. Um, I think kind of a lack of a good administrative policy in terms of how do you make changes in the comp plan and when is it okay for a department to make that? When does it need the administrator and HR's approval and, and how do you adjust positions? I think there needs to be some more defined um, policy guidance for that. Um, what's required for a position? And we dealt with this in Appleton too. Departments are saying I absolutely have to have a master's degree or a bachelor's degree but HR would say you really don't need a master's or a bachelor's degree, and if you looked at the market, it isn't required, it might be a preferred. And so you wanna make sure that there isn't a manipulation of the system, that you have kind of a standard, what is required for educational background, what is required for experience level, and that's applied consistently across the departments. Um, TO changes. Um, what I heard today from some departments is there's some modification of TOs that haven't gone through any approval process. So someone is no longer performing, let's say, in a supervisory role, but they're rated as a supervisor, and that was changed just because, I don't know why that was changed, and so there was no approval for that, right? So there's been a lack, and I think a lot of that comes from the turnover in your HR department, is not having really good guidance and administration for um, how things move in the compensation plan. Patrick touched a little bit upon, and I think we're all used to in government, is we just want to get it done and we don't want to have any changes, right? Because nobody likes change. I think with this compensation plan, you need to be open to change. So if all of a sudden we feel like we aren't getting applications, we can't fill a position, or a job has changed, either because we made a structural change or over the course of 10 years, through gradual and incremental changes, this position no longer looks like it did 10 years ago. A department needs to be able to come forward to HR and say, I think we need to relook at this position. I no longer think it's placed appropriately in that comp plan, and you need to have a process to allow for that to happen to keep your compensation plan uh, current. Um, 
I think those were the majority of things that like I kind of observed from just a human resource process thing. There was one other thing Patrick didn't touch on though that I wanted to mention too. When he does the evaluation in his system, he does not look at the person, the name, the gender of those positions. He is evaluating those positions based on the job duties and what was submitted in that JDQ. So you can think of a JDQ as like a really comprehensive job description and those were completed by the employees and then were supposed to be vetted up the chain of command and then through HR should have also kind of vetted those to say are there any anomalies, things that don't make sense and I think with some of the transition in your HR department, I'm not sure that that vetting really took place. That's why I think it was important for the departments to have an opportunity to come today and really kind of talk through some of those changes. Um, and then I already touched on some of the job documentation in your NeoGov system appears to be outdated. So one of the recommendations would be once you get through this compensation study, I think all of your job descriptions need to be updated to comply with what was submitted on the JDQs. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, there, uh, Perella? I, I was wondering, the... So if I understand correctly, the, um, some people will be able to adjust the JDQ to capture some nuances or substantial aspects, I don't know, that perhaps were not captured from the start. Is that right? That's what you said, Patrick, right? That, that is going to happen in some cases. Okay, so uh, you met six departments heads and how many positions were actually addressed and which translates in how many jobs? I could probably count a little bit. I kind of made notes. I think between 20 and 30. It was between 20 and 30, I think is a safe number overall. It might've been a little bit more than that, some of them were grouped together, but I think by and large it was not an overwhelming. 20, 30, excuse me, Patrick, 20, 30 actual jobs or Correct. positions? Jobs, jobs, actual jobs. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Chair, can I ask a, a question to uh, uh, Caitlin? By all means. Caitlin, the, so you said that the, as far as munis goes, we, the, the manual type of job that hypothetically we should be doing or need to do if we wanted to uh, remember the, the munis manual work that you were referring to, is that because we don't have a module on munis or is because munis doesn't have that capability in, in any case? It is actually the current version of MUNIS we are on. So we are doing an upgrade again in a few weeks and so that will become available. However, I did talk to the MUNIS, uh, I went to a MUNIS training a few weeks back and she told me that any payrolls that are being run in the current system will not work with the, even once we go to the upgrade. So it would have to be any payrolls that are run in the upgraded version that back pay is a, is a bit easier to do. So it would be a bit easier to do with the new upgrade? It will, but the July 10th date, that will be a payroll that was run in our old system and that would be very difficult. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on this one? Chair, just one more. Thank you. Caitlin, the COLA, the 2.5% 2, uh, 2 for COLA, that would be implemented no matter what, right? That will be determined during budget time. So we have an anticipation that there will be a cost of living adjustment no matter what the outcome of the compensation study is, but depending on how much the compensation study takes of the budget, that COLA uh, could be adjusted. So it could be less than 2.5? or more, I suppose, depending on how much our um, number, how our figures come through. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Oh, there, Floyd Kipanaski. And a follow-up to that, all employees get a cost of living adjustment. 
Correct. So the cost of living adjustment actually will move the entire scale for non-represented employees. And then we already have uh, contracts for those who are uh, represented in the union and they have already uh, negotiated the rate of increase for them. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Now's our time to ask while we have Patrick and Sandy in the room with us. Alder Perella. I'm not sure, Chair, if this is the right time, but I would like to, to hear from the department's heads as well. Should we do that at another time or should we do that now? I would say that's not germane to what we currently have in front of us. That would have to be something separate and in the future. Okay, let's just keep that going. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other discussion? Well, Administrator Wolf. Oh. <laughs> Close one. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Chair. I just want to thank everybody. I know that this process has been going um, for a very long time. I know that we're still, any program that the um, that would come forward, uh, especially when it comes to a wages, um, we're never going to please everybody. There's been a lot of discussion and uh, concern whether our, our past program was actually um, the correct program that we should have in place. And again, we don't have any documentation to, to better understand how that was developed and put together, but we've had it for, for many years from a prior uh, human resource position. We've done our due diligence in communicating with all of the departments and we've done a, uh, a really good job, I feel, in talking with them and getting Patrick and Sandy on board to help continue that discussion. Again, there's, there's still gonna be some, um, some frustration and some friction just because there's, um, we all have our, our different opinions on what's going on, but really what, what we are bringing forward is a program um, that has a, a good, strong foundation that we can build on into the future. And again, the implement, it is two pieces. The implementation part is really gonna be budget driven um, for the city to decide on. And I know Caitlin's been running all kinds of different concepts and how it's going to work. And we have to be very careful because we're trying to fix what has, ha what has been a problem for many, many, many years, as we've um, obviously uncovered. And, when, and again, we wanna take care of our employees and we wanna make sure that we're marketable for new employees coming in. So again, I wanna thank everyone. I wanna thank Patrick for coming in. I wanna thank Sandy for coming in and helping out um, from an HR perspective. And uh, I just wanna thank the committee for, again, allowing us time to continue to review and answer questions and make sure that we vet this as best as possible. But I still feel very strongly that this is a good program. We as a, as a city can continue to make additional improvements moving forward, but at least we've got a good platform um, that makes sense. So thank you. Thank you. And I also wanted to make sure that I took the time to thank both you, Patrick and Sandy, for coming in today and everybody who's been involved in this process. It has not been uh, small or fast, I wouldn't say. Uh, I know there's been a lot of time and effort that's gone in uh, trying to shape the absolute best plan that we can put together for all of our city employees, whether it's uh, you representing your own position, your department, or uh, working on the administrative side of putting the final plan together. Uh, all that uh, time spent is very much appreciated. I hope that that reflects how much we care, uh, that that is something that everybody is noticing because I, a lot of people are going above and beyond. With that, I will ask if there are any other comments on this one. Otherwise, we'll be looking for a motion to file. All right, we have a motion and a second then, seeing no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 
All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes haven't, the motion passes. Thank you again. Uh, next up we have item number 15, almost done, <laughs> which is the hiring process update for the Director of Human Resources and Labor Relations. Administrator Wall. Thank you, I was getting all excited about leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we do have another interview uh, with another candidate tomorrow. Otherwise, uh, we've had three, uh, three applications uh, and really we'll, we'll know more after tomorrow's uh, interview on the next steps um, to, you know, to whittle it down to hopefully uh, you know, two or one. So that's where we are today. Questions on the update? Otherwise, that one is for discussion only, so I will move on to state that our next regularly scheduled meeting is on August 8th. And with that, we have exhausted our agenda and are looking for a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. Fastest motions of the evening. Uh, we have a motion and a second, then seeing no discussion. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye. The ayes have it. The motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Aye.